Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to VMAC 2021. Um, my name is Suzanne Robinson. I'm Director of Finance at Greater Manchester Mental Health, and I'm also the really, really proud Senior Responsible Officer for Value Makers. So here we are again. It's our next annual conference. Slightly different format this time. I've got two audiences. So I've got my wonderful audience here in front of me, but I've also got the virtual audience at home. So we're really hoping that there's lots of people tuning in wherever you are, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, and hopefully you're in for a really exciting conference today. So a few quick messages from me before we kick things off. So we really do want to encourage as many people to get involved in the conference. So there'll be opportunities for you to put questions forward to some of our speakers, make comments. So please do use the Teams function to get your questions into, uh, into the chat box and we'll pick as many up and we'll feed them through. Same for my audience here. We will have roving mics around and we'll come and try and capture as many of your questions as possible. So this is VMAC, so we love a bit of tweeting, don't we? So please, everybody, I want to see photos. I want to see where you're watching the conference today. Who are you with? What are you enjoying? What do you, you know, what's the, the buzz in the office uh, with the things that we're talking about today? So it's hashtag VMAC 2021. Let's get ourselves trending. So it's a live event, obviously, but we do appreciate that not everybody's going to be able to tune in today. So we're recording it and it'll be available on the FFF website so you can come and watch it all again or you can pick out the sections that you want to share with your team. But please do go and have a look after the event. It will be there. So what have we got to come? So we've got a, a brilliant afternoon lined up. We've got uh, a session coming up around career development, which hopefully inspire lots of you to see uh, particular individuals and how they've excelled throughout their careers. We've got some brilliant guest speakers. Uh, it wouldn't be VMAC if we didn't showcase the work of our Value Makers Network. Super proud, as always, that we've got opportunity to showcase some of the amazing innovations and the work that people are doing across the network. So huge part of what we do uh, here at the conference. And then our finale is our VMAC uh, awards. Really excited. There were so many people that put forward nominations. And so the end of our, our conference today, it will be an opportunity for us to celebrate the magnificent network that we've got and some of the individuals and teams that contribute to what we do. OK, so I'm really hoping that uh, this morning as many of you as possible got opportunity to, to listen to the one NHS finance launch and the finance strategy. Uh, if you did, then I hope you got some real confidence that this programme is genuinely built around what we think is important. I think there's a genuinely uh, an opportunity there to take the listening and the feedback and the comments that we all fed in. And we were brilliant on that. Don't get me wrong. I know how hard the value makers worked to be able to encourage as many people to contribute. And I think the programme that we've got is really representative of that. So loads more work and opportunities for us to keep involved in that. And the forums that we've set up regionally will continue to give us that opportunity to, to keep involved. So that does lead me really nicely on to our first session. And I've enlisted the help of my wonderful value maker uh, colleagues today and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Beth who's one of my regional value maker leads Beth and she's going to facilitate and chair our first session which is opportunity for us to hear from each of the program leads from One Edge Finance so I will hand over to Beth. Thank you Suzanne. Hi everyone welcome to the value maker annual conference. I'm Beth and I am the finance transactions manager at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. Welcome to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so just to start on our NHS careers section I would love if you could each give us sort of a brief overview of your career today and how you've got into your positions. Um, so Jenny if we could start with you. Yeah that's absolutely thanks Beth. Um, so when I was 15 I was going to be a vet. So obviously that's turned out well, hasn't it? Um, and I went off to university, I sort of changed my mind at about 15, 16 and went off to university and did maths because I liked doing numbers um, and that was as good a reason as I had for choosing what I was going to do at uni. Um, and as I was finishing university, I still didn't know what I kind of wanted to be, you know. Um, so I went to the career service and literally tripped over the stack of um, NHS grad training scheme brochures. Um, and at that point in time, which you can probably start to work out my age, you could apply separately to the general scheme and the finance scheme. Um, so I applied to both. They were the only things I applied for. 
Um, so, you know, not really spreading my bets very, very well there. But anyway, the general management scheme didn't want me. So um, that was, uh, and, and actually, I really did want the finance scheme because I felt having another qualification um, on top of a degree was, was not a bad idea, really. Um, so I came into uh, the NHS grad scheme in the Northwest. Um, and I was based at North Manchester General, and now we, my organisation now also runs North Manchester General, so I've kind of got back to where I started from again. Um, and spent best part of three years at North Manchester and a bit of time in uh, Calderdale PCT, as it was, um, at, the point, at that point in time. Um, and I think as a grad trainee, you're just so privileged. Um, you know, you get to move around and you get to see lots of different bits of the finance uh, function. Um, and it gives you a really good grounding. Anyway, um, I then decided that I needed a bit of time off. So I went and spent six months on a yacht in Greece. Um, I was working. Um, I wasn't just taking time off. Um, and, and you know, when you do something like that and you kind of think, um, how am I going to sell myself back? You know, how do I say that, you know, spending six months on a boat in the sun uh, makes a difference to, to your career? And I think they genuinely think there are a couple of things that, that I brought from, back from that. And one of them was about customer service. I mean, that company was just all about the holiday makers having an absolutely fantastic time. Um, and that customer service ethos, I think, applies to NHS finance as well. Um, you know, bringing it back into uh, what we do and what our teams do. Um, anyway, I came back to um, rainy West Yorkshire and went and worked in the ambulance service for a bit. and. Uh, another PCT. Um, I actually chose to go move into technical accounts for a couple of years. It was another point in time of um, reorganisation. So I think we did six sets of accounts in two years because because we were doing you know closed down accounts at 30th of September and opening up and all this sort of stuff. Great experience, but I did feel I'd earned my, earned my badges by then. Um, you know, a couple of years doing that, um, and so I went back into management accounts. Um, in another hospital that now belongs to us, which is Withenshaw. So I um, spent about 18 months in Withenshaw. Um, and that sort of management accounts role, I just think is a fabulous role. Um, you know, the, the ability to impact on patient care is absolutely there in those sorts of roles. Um, and then a job came up uh, at Harrogate, Deputy Director of Finance, and I didn't think I was going to get it, um, but it was the sort of job that I thought probably that's my next role. Fairly, you know, um, Harrogate is a sort of small and perfectly formed DGH, um, you know, really great place to have a, a real grounding. Um, and I stayed there for five years uh, and it was it was a great place to be um, and looked after the whole of finance. And it, that's really stood me in good stead because, um, you know, as you get into bigger and bigger organisations, you've of course specialised more. So doing that in a, a, a relatively small organisation was great grounding. Um, and then I went to Leeds. Um, and worked uh, for Tony Whitfield in Leeds. Um, and uh, I know people in nature for me will know Tony really well. Uh, and, and, you know, he taught me a heck of a lot. Um, and then I worked for Simon in Leeds. Um, so, um, and then I moved across to Manchester um, and, and into this role uh, now. Um, and I think, I mean, what, what do you pick out, you know, of a career and, and what, what's happened? And actually, I'm not sure it's about which job, but it is about the people you work with. And, and lots and lots of the time, it's what you learn from people and how to do things really well. Um, occasionally, you learn how not to do things, and that, those, those lessons are worth picking up as well. Um, but, you know, um, I've been privileged to work with all sorts of fantastic people within finance, um, across kind of corporate services, but especially amongst clinicians, um, you know, and, and I, I come to work to serve patients, and, and I think that's, you know, I, that's what stood me in good stead, really, is because ultimately, can I go home and say I've done something good for patients and I've done something good for taxpayers, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Beth. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hardo Birdie. I'm the Group Chief Finance Officer at Barts. Um, but let, let, let's re rewind a, a, a few decades, even. Um, <laughs> So uh, where did it all begin? Um, well, it all started going wrong. No, it all started um, uh, when I grew up in Birmingham. And I, I grew up in a, in a part of Birmingham um, where those of you of a certain age will remember there was the Birmingham riots. Uh, and that was about 100 yards from my bedroom window. 
Uh, and I was, I remember that being really young and uh, looking out the bedroom window thinking, I want to go there uh, because it's all noise and all sorts of things. Uh, and then what, the school I went to was um, uh, officially classed as the worst school in England at the time. Uh, and it kind of affected the way you, well, certainly affected the way I approach things in terms of where I grew up, my education wasn't all great and therefore I needed to make something of my life. Um, so my, my mindset was I either focus on education or I'll either end up somewhere not very nice um, and I could see that happening around me. So I, I did focus quite a lot on, uh, on getting an education and um, yeah, and I happened to study in Manchester, um, so um, that, that was great. And uh, after university, I managed to work in uh, a temporary job in, in banking. And uh, at that point, I was also applying for jobs. I went for the graduate scheme uh, and I went to, I, I got onto the graduate scheme and I, I went to the, 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 the banking bosses and said, oh, I I'm, I'm got this offer. And they, their response was, whatever they give you, we'll double it. And it, it they, they lavished everything and said, you know, whatever you want, we, we can do that. So I sat there as a young person thinking, right, I, this is a strange dilemma. Um, how do you make that choice? Uh, and at that time, I didn't have uh, value makers or anyone to help uh, me make that decision. Uh, so I really looked at actually my own values of what is it that drives me? Uh, and I harked back to my upbringing. I thought, yeah, inequalities was a big thing for me. Um, and I had seen lots of inequalities, whether it's access to healthcare or access to education. And I thought, well, I'm not really going to get that in, in banking. I can't make a difference there. And I couldn't really see a good career path. Um, whereas I thought the NHS was much more aligned to my values. So that was the criteria I used to really make that decision. And that's the path I went on. Uh, and I trained in, 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 in Birmingham in, in the West Midlands. Uh, and uh, I spent a good few years there working across various organisations. And just like Jenny, you, know, you make sure you learn from people and surround yourself by good, experienced, knowledgeable people. They will look after you. Uh, and I can tell you all the people who have guided my career and have given me really good advice. Uh, and one of those was the, the regional uh, director for, for the West Midlands, um, who gave me a really sort of stark piece of advice, which was um, when you look at the directors of finance in the West Midlands, and this was a number of years ago, you can see that you're going to find it difficult to get there. Um, try your luck in, 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 in London. Uh, and I think I knew what he meant by that. Uh, and yeah, I went to London and yeah, funnily enough, he went to London as well. Um, and again, I managed to gain more experience in, in different organisations. But I could see this ceiling appearing um, of uh, how to make it up to a, a deputy director of finance. Uh, and and there were walls and there were ceilings that were I, I felt were, were, were not good. But I also found my career accelerated because I was working, had a good mentor, I had good people who were supporting me and I felt I could, I could really accelerate and my career started to accelerate. In fact, I thought it was, I, I could do anything. I, I felt as if I was on fire uh, and I found myself talking to uh, an old director of finance of mine uh, and he gave me another good piece of advice, which was, you're really young, what's the hurry? Um, make sure you're ready when you're when you're there and that was really important to me because I was I, I wasn't ready uh, I thought I was ready but I just wanted the title more than anything else and that that's not the right attitude um, so I, I, I really took on board uh, the advice got more experience uh, worked in different types of organizations commissioning uh, strategic health authority uh, and managed to work my way and um, on the week I became a father and bought a house, I became a director of finance. So yeah, great going. Uh, and um, 
and, and that was my mm. first sort of board level role uh, and that then uh, took its own life and um, worked my way through that uh, but I was always conscious that I needed to make a difference, a bigger difference um, to uh, to people in finance, but also add more back into the NHS. Uh, and every time I moved job, jobs, I went from, for instance, commissioning into provider. I was told that's not possible. Uh, I was told when I moved from a mental health trust to an acute trust, that wasn't possible. Um, and most of the time I ignore that advice um, because I I trusted my own ability um, and thought about what I can achieve. Um, and that's about bringing down those uh, barriers uh, which are around you and having some good people to support you. And that's why it's really important that things like value makers do transcend these values um, across our organisations. Uh, and then uh, moving into to Bart's where I am now, which is which is a large organisation, and I feel very privileged to be in that position. Privileged to work with great clinical staff, some of the, the world's best clinicians, developing responses to opening up the Nightingale Hospital, running vaccination centres, designing the largest critical care centre in Europe, doing all sorts of amazing things for really deprived populations. Uh, and am I my stamp on this is making sure that I'm championing reducing health inequalities uh, and supporting staff development. And this all comes back to my values and I've tried to give people advice about what is it you stand for as you shape your career. Uh, as you enter the NHS, try to think about where you will add most value. Uh, and for me, it's about those two aspects. So when I was um, asked to do the sort of chairing the National Finance Academy, it kind of all felt like this is it, this this is what I, I need to be doing. So now I've got this opportunity to really influence and, and shape how we develop finance staff. And what's really important is, is that, that we as a finance community take that on board uh, and own that. Uh, so I feel very lucky to have got to where I have. I think I've been fortunate to to talk to a lot of people and get that advice, but I would say you make your own luck as well. So you put yourselves in that position um, and don't expect luck to happen to you. Go out and make it happen. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that as well. Thanks. So and finally, Simon. Okay, thanks. Uh, and just reflecting before I dive into my career, uh, uh, the value of this, because uh, like, I wish I'd have been able to listen to what you said when I started out, because I would have uh, made less mistakes, <laughs> uh, which I suppose that's theme uh, for what I'm going to say is, uh, you know, I'd made a, you know, look back, why did I do it like that? So, but you know, it turned out all right in the end. Uh, so I suppose if just uh, pick out a few things. So how did I get into NHS finance? So I I did, a, uh, I used to live in Sheffield, I moved to Leeds uh, to do my uh, degree uh, back in 1985, it was a long time ago. Uh, and passed my uh, degree, just got 2-2, two -two. you know, try harder. That's a, there's a, uh, and then I was, oh, I need to get a, a job in Leeds because at the time my girlfriend was staying in Leeds to uh, do a teacher training. So this is how much, you know, what jobs are there? I don't know if any keen students of uh, uh, in recent history of the uh, United Kingdom. In 1988, jobs were a bit thin on the ground. There was this lady called Margaret Thatcher who was in charge of the uh, the government and everything. Uh, so it was a bit different. So there's only very few jobs uh, going. And I applied for a couple. Uh, applied for the audit commission. Uh, didn't pass the first interview, uh, applied to be a manager of a wine shop, didn't get an interview, uh, but I did get an interview for uh, a trainee management accountant at Leeds Western Health Authority, which is a thing that doesn't exist anymore, uh, but it was basically the LGI in the, the hospitals at the west west side of uh, Leeds. So I've done the, uh, I've done the uh, going around in a circle thing as, as well. And I thought, oh, I've got to really got to get this job. So I went, I'd, my degree was uh, politics and I'd done a, a course on health policy uh, for a, a term. So I went back and got all the books out for that and for three days and revised it all. Uh, 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 I did this interview and they were saying, uh, I did this, yeah, sounded good to me anyway, exposition on uh, all the things that were happening. There were things called the Rainer Scrutiny Reviews or something at the time, all, all these different things. And then there was one guy uh, said to me, and this is really, for me, is a foundational thing about what I was talking about earlier at the launch of 1HS Finance, about what, what do we do in finance? Yeah. 
Uh, and this guy kept asking me, he said, what do you think we do in finance? And I would say things like, well, you work with the clinicians to manage the resources. And he said, no, 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 no. What do you think we do in finance? And he kept going, I never gave him the right answer. He asked me about five times, you know, interview technique was uh, different in those days. And I finally realized what he meant some years later. He meant we pay the invoices, we pay the staff, you know, all these really important uh, things, the stuff huge numbers of our team do every day to keep things going. But I didn't know that. But anyway, my, to my amazement, I got that job. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and then I started and I was put in uh, you know, research and technical, which is basically if anybody uh, does cost accounts, does anybody in the room does cost accounts? Wonderful. Well, in the good old days, there used to be these things called Kerner returns, which, uh, and you used to get all these huge piles of paper uh, and you had to add it all up and you, you might use the computer, which was over there in the corner, you know, uh, and I had absolutely no idea what these things were. No one explained them, they just say add them up. Right? And it was the most boring job I have ever ever done. But the, the, the thing about it was I had the key thing that I had no idea how it connected to anything. So I was totally unengaged from it. Uh, so really different. So basically after about three months I was doing so badly they thought I was nearly going to get the sack. Uh, so they, they they had a stern word with me and they put me in management accounts. So look if you don't put your ideas up you know, you're going to get there. Well, I'm going to get you. Yeah, goodbye. Uh, and, and through a process of, I had my mentor at the time, this guy called uh, Pete, he was my boss. He gave me a job to do that I could actually understand what it was I was doing, how that connected to uh, patients. It's a thing called joint finance at the time. It's not a thing anymore. But uh, And then I got really into it. I started to see how that I'm doing something here that's actually, I'm improving something, I'm doing something else, I've got really into it and I'm, I, I can do this. And that was that was fine. And that was a, then a theme through my what, early career of trying to improve things. You know, and I'm feeling, of, you know, there's a point to doing this. I made all sorts of mistakes around that, work, you know, working ridiculous hours and all those sorts of things. But that was that's a theme that's gone through my career. Uh, the other thing was, then, oh, you've got to do your exams. Exams? There, yeah, you know, I've done exams, me, I've got a degree. Absolutely fine. And then I saw the textbooks, and, oh my God. And then, uh, you know, I knew you've got to learn all the textbook and answer all the questions. You can't just, uh, and I didn't pass my exams for years. I was terrible. So there's a really uh, good piece of advice, you know, pass your exams. Uh, well, you know, if you're doing professional qualification, don't do it like I do pass your exams and that would be really good. So eventually did do that. And that was a real big learning experience, obviously. So just that that theme of wanting to improve things, uh, you need to pass your exams. And then the other thing I noticed in my career is the people, you know, so I look around all people, I, uh, you know, uh, good colleagues and friends I know, know here. And that's so important. You go through that career, always support your colleagues, you know, if you want the support of your colleagues, support your colleagues. Yeah, and you've got all the friends you make through that career as you, as you go on. Uh, but anyway, did that and sort of progressed, progressed, progressed slowly, slowly. You know, got to a bit of a different ceiling than you're referring to. Harder, but I hadn't passed my exams, so I couldn't get beyond a certain point. And then eventually passed them. So then fine, progress, uh, and I eventually got to the point where I started applying for finance director uh, jobs. Now. The first one I got an interview for, I did absolutely disastrously bad interview. So, you know, that, there's loads of stuff out there where you can get support on interview technique and what have you. But at the, the end of it, I had to uh, go for feedback actually on the day. The guy was from an uh, education background, the guy, uh, and I'd come, I knew I'd come last because they called you in in the order that you know, come last. And he said, uh, he said to me, he said, oh, Mr. Worthington, he said. He says, you have a very open and humorous style. I said, oh, thank you very much. Which we don't think is appropriate for a finance director. <laughs> said, oh, right. Well, so, you know, ha, you know, so hopefully, I can't remember his name, but if he's still, uh, still around, you know, you, you can make that work, having an open and humorous style and, and being a finance director. Uh, but anyway, eventually uh, got a job in a very, very small ambulance service. Okay, it doesn't exist anymore. It's now part of the Yorkshire Ambulance Service and a bit of the North East Ambulance Service. And uh, again, that, that thing about that, don't, that sort of uh, what people say to you, oh, don't go for that, Simon. You'll never get back out. 
what are you talking about? It was one of the most wonderful experiences of my, my career working in a modern service and did that for a number of years. Then I got back in the acute sector, uh, being finance director for, for a bit. I'd been an acting chief executive uh, for, for a year. And then I went back into the acute sector as a deputy director of finance. Yeah, in the hospital at the time in the country in London, which had the biggest deficit in the, in the country. Uh, and so I, and I'd never actually, I was an assistant director when I got the, I'd never actually been a deputy director of finance. So that was a big thing. Uh, but again, that sort of improvement focus and, do, you know, and that's uh, there did my first, oh, it wasn't my first, no, it wouldn't have been, but a very, very memorable thing with staff where we, we had a suggestion that we should have uh, an employee of the month. Yeah. And it was our employee. You know, and we had employment of the month. I remember this guy called Derek won. And Derek was the, the guy who, uh, you know, was a really nice guy, did a really professional job. He always helped people. And the team there had been so through so much. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just, I just done the presentation on the restructure where we're going to have less jobs and everything. Uh, and, uh, you yeah, and fine. And now it's employee of the month. Right, and, uh, and I'm reading out, and it's such a blind and Derek, and it's Derek, and they're <laughs> like that. you could not, the, the applause, it was so, and then, then the power of uh, appreciating people uh, became very evident to me. So I then worked through, worked through uh, various di different organisations, I went to Bolton, very big, great, uh, you know, team there, and then joy of my career, ended back up at Leeds, I mean, very sad, you know, how I ended up there with Tony, but you know, my local hospital. So that's the other thing I'd like to mention through through that, that, that working with clinical colleagues uh, to such a, a thing that is so important to people and, and, and the country. Uh, it's just such a, a, you know, wonderful thing. And that's why I often, you know, why, why do we want NHS finance to be the best place to work? Because we need the absolute best people in there so we can do the best job for the staff uh, and the patients. Yeah, so and I'm loving it. So, yeah, like a career of happenstance and things going wrong and not really, not really having a plan. But, you know, if, if you support your colleagues and do with people as you want to be done to yourself uh, uh, and you focus on the patient and wanting to improve, you, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a really great insight. So we've got a question um, for all the panellists. It's a bit of a reflective question, really. Um, so what has working in NHS finance meant for you whilst working through the pandemic? So we'll start with Hardev. OK, yeah. Uh, so working through the pandemic, um, a lot of staff um, were working from home, finance staff. And that's a big cultural change for us. And um, also plays to how we adapt to more flexible and agile working. And uh, that's a whole different topic, but that's something that we've had to adjust to. Uh, other bits is we've had people uh, being uh, uh, re-appointed uh, to other roles uh, to support clinicians and other frontline staff during the pandemic. That was challenging uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, we also in finance uh, managed to work a lot more collaboratively across the system and that's been a big change and that's only going to help us going forward and we've seen that on lots of lots of examples where i am you know we built uh, a, a, a over 20 million pound critical care unit in six weeks on time and budget and you would only do that with the support of your stakeholders and the people around you we would never be able to do that so it's amazing what could be done if you will uh, put your efforts uh, and, and see each other for for fighting the single cause uh, and that's how it held us good going forward so lots of good things have come out uh, as a result but you can't get away from the devastating impact it has had on people including finance um, and so you know i always start off by by thanking those who have been working and continue to work in very challenging times thank you and jenny yeah i mean i probably can't say it better than hard uh, really i absolutely echo all of that um I think the thing I was hugely impressed by was the um, the the, um, the real positive attitude to how do I help? You know, what, whatever it is, how do I help? Whether it's you know um, 
we, we had our accounts payable team uh, move into materials management as lots of people will have done you know to, to make sure there was PPE on the shelves and those sorts of things uh, and just it was really humbling actually to see the the real um, people just you know leaning in really and saying you know what's what can I do how, how do I help um, and you know just some some incredible moments you know the things like you say the things we achieved through you know first first wave probably in particular but um you know that we kept kept lots and lots of services going and also looked after lots and lots of people with a disease that really was unknown you know um and you know and and you know i've got you know we'll all have our own little tales of cracking what what was what was i doing you know <laughs> we had i had a call i was at home because it was my daughter's uh, fourth birthday and um I got a call from our director of procurement and said, Jenny, I need you to sign this off. Uh, and it was millions of pounds. At the time, I was acting CFO, so I didn't actually have the, <laughs> didn't have my name on the door yet. Um, and um, and it was outside my limit. And I was like, oh, my word. Oh, and by the way, says Simon, Simon's absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, by the way, they want 50% cash up front. You know, and you go, oh, my word, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I go. Oh my word! You know, this is just not a decision I ever thought I would be taking. You know, and you look back on that stuff and kind of go, "Wow!" You know, when it was the right decision to take, we did it. It was the right decision to take. Um, but everybody will have those examples of where they worked completely outside the comfort zone. Um, and I think now we need to help people probably reflect on the good stuff we all did, um, because I think you know it feels to us probably in the northwest that we're in steady state with quite a lot of COVID patients in and it's not going away tomorrow you know so actually we've got to keep our teams um going now in this environment with COVID for, for probably quite a long time um and recognize the really hard stuff we did in that those early early months really actually we're doing some really hard stuff now as well so um so thank you to people that are you know are, are working within that Thank you, Sam. Would you like to add anything? Well, uh, yeah, echo, echo all that. Yeah, the massive thanks to everybody who's uh, been working throughout throughout this really uh, unbelievable uh, period. And I think the uh, I'll mention quickly three things. So, firstly, just generally how the team uh, pulled together uh, through that, and people doing different things. A couple of which I'll comment on in a moment, but that sense of purpose and people pulling together. Uh, you know, really profound and straight, you know, and, and we do regular staff temperature checks and it's really interesting for me, uh, the sort of lot of indicators in our staff temperature checks during this period have actually got a lot better. They're already pretty good staff with, but, uh, you know, that's really interesting to me. So that throughout adversity, the team has definitely got closer together. And then the going above and beyond and doing things you never thought you were going to do, right? So uh, we, like many people, Right at the beginning, PPE was a big issue. So we need a team of people uh, to ring on spec companies who might, you know, uh, buildings merchants. Have you got any PPE? Who are those people with a finance team uh, doing that? And one lady, one, I was in one, one of the weekends, we needed to go and get some PPE from Sheffield and there was no one to get, no one to drive the truck to show who's going to do, and there's a lady called Bev, uh, Mark will know her, uh, Bev Petican, uh, in yeah, and she's who's a you know uh, very I don't know how to very nicely presented you know, l you know lady, and she said I'll drive the truck. Right, and she drove. She never drove a truck before. Drove all the way to Sheffield, got the PPE, came all the way back, on you know, and that's like oh wow, you know, so really moving. Uh, those that's what I remember about it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so another one to all the panellists. Um, what one bit of advice can you give to those starting out in NHS finance um, who want to progress but are maybe a bit shy or um, not that confident or are maybe a bit introverted? How they can reach the, how they can reach their career goals? So Jenny? Um, so, so this is something I think about quite a bit because I've got quite a diverse range of people in my senior team. Um, I've got somebody who's really um, I would say it's really quite introverted. I'm quite on the other end of the scale, as you've probably worked out. Um, and so how I, I, you know, I see it as my role to work as best I can to support him, if you see what I mean. So, you know, how can I change what I do so that I get the best out of him? Um, and I think that's good when people recognise it. I think the tricky bit is helping people recognise where, you know, and that each of our 
each of our leaders, our managers in our teams, has some of those skills about how do you how do you recognise where people are coming from and, and, and what what each individual can bring into the workplace. Um, so I think for for somebody who is you know perhaps not wanting to stick the hand up or um, it's probably you know going slightly different routes. So you might not be someone who wants to stick the hand up in a room like this, um, but actually you can do it virtually now. You know, so you can, you know, so so I think some of the stuff that's happened through the last 18 months actually has supported greater inclusivity of all sorts of diversity, including that sort of actually I'm not going to sit in a conference and put my hand up, you know, because actually we can you can just type it anonymously now. So I think there are different tools now, probably. And and, you know, potentially there's something about buddying up with someone, you know, talk to a colleague and, you know, this is how I feel. How do you do it? You know, those sorts of conversations um, and, you know, reach out, but maybe reach out in a, you know, in, that, in a way that people are comfortable with, I guess. Thank you, Simon. Well, OK, so it's a really uh, important uh, question. I mean, I suppose uh, no one perhaps believe me, I don't know, but I am actually very shy. I am, the, uh, uh, in, you know, I, I'm and that there is that thing where doing things like this, for instance, you know, as you're developing, you go on, you, you can learn to be comfortable in, in doing that. And that's a really important message for all colleagues. But uh, I think if you just think about, we're talking to the value maker movement uh, in that. So like uh, giving opportunities to people who might not have had them to contribute in, in, in meetings that aren't, you know, really hierarchical and stuff like that. I, th I know in my uh, my team that enabled some colleagues uh, to have voice who, who perhaps didn't have voice before. You know, uh, I think chairing our local volume maker group has been an another one where you're encouraging someone. I've never chaired a meeting. Well, you can give it a go. It's again, it's an non-threatening uh, environment. So using and being feeling supported by colleagues uh, to do that. We had uh, we've got Rexford, who's our new chair of our uh, volume maker uh, group, and uh, you know. We had a really great turnout of uh, value makers to that meeting because to support Rex within his first uh, go at chairing it. So I think in different, it is something you can uh, sort of overcome you know, and, work, and work on and practice uh, helps and finding opportunities. And Jenny made a uh, great uh, description of some of the ways of doing it, but find opportunities to encourage people. Uh, and then that, that thing that everybody's got is valuable as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm never more delighted when I look around at our value maker group and we've got loads of people from payroll and from, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable in there and they're talking and, do, and doing things because they are really valuable uh, uh, team members. Uh, it's not just all about the high fluting sort of, you know, management accounts people do great jobs, but, you know, there are, everybody does a great job. So uh, that inclusivity thing there is important. Thank you, Hardev. I would <coughs> just add that uh, I wouldn't want people to think that being introverted is a disadvantage or, a, or or seen as a something that will hold you back. So um, I'm pretty confident in saying there's a there's a vast amount of finance leaders in the NHS who are introverts, um, and I think it goes back to Simon's point. You learn to adapt, and you you learn your skills and you learn your trade in that in in that environment. Um, and to that extent, there is something about the these bits which i call the, the sort of soft skills uh, how do we uh, allow people to develop those skills how do we allow people to feel more confident uh, and to raise those discussions but also uh, learn how to manage those uh, and they are options so jenny talked about some of those uh, pieces particularly on the virtual environment uh, which in the face face will be shadowing and, and those type of uh, opportunities uh, so there are things that can be put in place to to help uh, individuals. I would also try things outside of work. Um, I remember I gave advice to someone to say, um, you know, chair a meeting at home with your family. Yeah, you'd be surprised how entertaining that can be, but it gets you out of your comfort zone and, and you know, it, it can work. So um, I think play with all of these options and ideas. Um, do what feels comfortable for you and really exploit your strengths as well. Um, and not think of it as a, as a disadvantage because uh, I think that's more of a mindset and, and, and focus on soft skill development. 
That's great. Thank you so much. So um, thank you so much to our panel um, and thank you for everyone for joining. Um, so we are now going to play our um, NHS careers animation um, ahead of our next panel session. So thank you. When you think about working in the NHS, which career springs to mind? Perhaps a doctor or a nurse? It might surprise you to learn that there are over 350 different types of career in the NHS, including a range of options as part of the finance team that support the sometimes life-saving services provided to patients by the NHS. NHS Finance is made up of a diverse workforce from all walks of life, often motivated by personal experience or a desire to contribute to something more socially valuable than a company's profit. A career in NHS Finance offers the opportunity to work within a system that really matters to the British public. The NHS touches everybody at some point in their life, and many people find that working within it offers them personal as well as job satisfaction. Recruitment for finance roles is happening right now, and a career in NHS Finance can offer you a fantastic array of opportunities to progress quickly with rewarding benefits. So, how does finance actually work in NHS organisations? Let's look at the main different types of NHS organisations and how their finance teams help the organisation to manage its money. A clinical commissioning group, or CCG, receive money from the government and use it to buy or commission services for their local population. Hospitals, mental health and community-based organisations receive some of that money and spend it on providing services for people like you and I. Finance staff in the NHS tend to work in four main areas. Financial services, where they manage the cash and make the payments to suppliers. Financial accounts, where they ensure that everything is accounted for correctly. Management accounts, who work with other NHS departments providing financial advice and guidance to them. Procurement and supplies, where they manage the sourcing, delivery and supply of healthcare products and equipment to end user departments. Now, let's look at different careers within NHS Finance. Finance Apprentice. I learn about all the different roles across the finance department and study professional exams so that I'm ready to take on more roles in the future. Accounts payable, I check the invoices received to the goods and services that we've ordered and if they match, I release them for payment. If they don't, I work with suppliers and departments to resolve things. Accounts receivable, I send invoices out to make sure that the organisation has enough cash to pay its staff and suppliers. Supply chain assistant. I replenish clinical consumables needed for the treatment of our patients, ensuring that we do not under or overstock products. Accountancy assistant. I make sure that all our financial transactions have been carried out properly. Procurement officer. My role is to source goods and consumables needed to treat our patients and keep our hospital running, ensuring value for money. Management accountant. Every department has their own budget to spend on staff, goods and services. I produce the monthly report that tell our budget holders how much they have spent and whether they are overspent or not. Cost Accountant. I work with the financial data to work out how much each procedure that we carry out costs us by looking at how much time was spent, what drugs were used and how long the patient stayed in hospital. Buyer. I ensure all orders are placed on time with suppliers and transacted correctly, supporting and providing advice on ordering systems to staff. Business Partner I work with departmental managers as their financial advisor. I interpret and use financial information to influence and shape their services and their business plans. Chief Finance Officer I am at the heart of the organization's management structure and play a key role in corporate decision making, ensuring the organization gets best value from its limited resources. By joining NHS Finance, you will become part of a talented, passionate team of people committed to providing the best care and treatment to patients. You will also enjoy one of the most competitive and flexible benefits packages offered by any employer in the UK. NHS Finance actively recruit people of all ages, backgrounds and levels of experience. 
Check out vacancies in your area today by visiting NHS Jobs. And for apprenticeship opportunities, visit the government's Find an Apprentice site.